Hi, everybody, and welcome to um, our second masterclass of the fall 2022 series. And today we're going to be talking about how to sequence poems in your book. Um, this is a big question I get from a lot of folks who are in my manuscript classes. Uh, it's a it's a real puzzle. And I um, like last time, you know, there is no formula. So I can't promise that you're going to walk away from today's class understanding exactly, uh, you know, how a formula for um, putting poems together in your book, but you will have a very clear idea of the approach that you can take to get clear on your particular book. So, um, you know, each book is unique, each poet is unique, uh, but there are some sort of fundamental strategies that we can apply universally to help us in this process. Um, so that's what we're going to cover today. So I let folks know um, on the list and last week we're going to be running a three-month poetry manuscript course starting in January. Um, you can go to the Poet to Poet website, um, you know, poettopoet.com slash 3MSS um, to find out more about this. So this is a an extended version of some of the concepts that we're talking about today, as well as um, many sort of uh, more, more detailed um, nuanced uh, approaches that come from the principles that are discussed in these classes. So if you're if you're really uh, committed to getting your manuscript done, I would love to include you in that class. There are only 10 spots available. So if you're interested, I encourage you to sign up right away because once the 10 slots are filled, um, registration will close. So sequencing is such a challenge, as we all know, even if we are experienced in creating books. I know many of you on this call actually have um, books that have been published. Um, somehow, it, you know, this, this piece of the puzzle uh, it might get a little bit easier, but but it it's one of those areas that I think we um, struggle with because there isn't a lot of advice out there to follow, and we're maybe you know kind of in an echo chamber of well this or that or you know what what should I be doing here, um, and so you know sequencing is a big part of like I said the questions that I get from students in manuscript classes over and over and over again okay okay well I have a theme you know I have a rough set of I, I think that all these poems are really great and I know that they can come together in a book I just don't know how so um, that's what we're going to talk about today and um, you know, this is something that I'm talking to a lot of the poets who I interview for the newsletter about. Um, it's something that I thought a lot about in my own work in Bloodline, which was published in 2017. Um, it's something I continue to refine my thinking about um, as I talk to other poets and as I, I go through these processes myself over and over again in, in multiple manuscripts. So I hope that what I can offer you is, is a little bit of insight, at least you know, a lens, like we said last week, a lens into how to approach um, this problem. Really not a problem, a good challenge, a good, a good um, puzzle. I think puzzle is a good word. Okay, so last week we covered um, sort of the seven areas for success for a standout manuscript. So we covered uh, why it's important to have theme, what you can think about in terms of structure, um, the importance of openers and closers, the idea of cohesion, as well as variation and um, title and formatting. So sequencing falls very uh, neatly from this idea of having theme, having structure, and um, going from having a lot of clarity around sort of those basic principles. Um, sequencing follows from that. So. So let's talk about, about that. So, so we talked last week about, um, you know, guiding the reader through the book's territory. Um, but before we talk a little bit more about 
um, theme and the book's territory and how that relates to sequencing, I just want to sort of acknowledge the challenges that we're up against. So, so why why is sequencing so hard? Um, in part, I think a lot of times it's because we haven't become clear enough about the book's territory. That was certainly true in my experience with my first book. Um, I wasn't clear enough about the book's territory to start. Once I became clear about, about the thematic content and about the territory, sequencing became much easier to um, accomplish. Um, we haven't decided which poems truly belong in the manuscript. I mean, this is a situation that I think we all probably start out with. Um, you know, we've, we've got this, this beautiful pile of poems that we've, we've polished, maybe we've published them, um, but without that clarity around the book's territory, it's very easy to have just a pile of poems that you start to try to sequence and you realize, oh my goodness, I'm not sure if all of these belong in this manuscript. Um, on the other hand, I have seen the case where uh, for some students, they've decided uh, ahead of time that poems don't fit, that actually do fit, right? So it can go either way in, in that, that sense of um, excluding poems too early or including too many to start. So, you know, there's a process we can go through to get clearer about the poems that belong. Um, we may not know that the book needs an arc of sorts. So we talked a little bit about structure. Structure is something that I talk a lot about in um, the manuscript classes that I teach that are a little bit longer. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, tricky um, topic because, uh, you know, because again, there isn't one formula, there isn't one structure that's going to work for all books. We have to discover the ideal structure for our own books. And, um, but we can think that we can sort of mistake the sequencing process for, uh, for that process of finding the arc. And in fact, we have to have an arc in mind. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute before we can um, sequence the poems in a, a meaningful way for the reader. Because really what we're talking about here is having a great experience laid out for the reader of the book. Um, other challenges. So in the absence of, of thinking about structure clearly, we tend to order the poems chronologically. Um, this is something I'm hearing from publishers. You know, they'll, a publisher the other day said, of, if I get a hundred manuscripts, you know, a quarter of those manuscripts will be ordered by season, right? So, you know, that can work as a, um, as a strategy, you know, Ada Lamone just came out with a book that's that's sequenced by by season. But if it's the only thing that we, it's if it's if it's the default and it's not, it's standing in for um, a structure that is more appropriate to the content, um, it, it's not helpful, right? So, so we tend to just fall into chronological order. We tend to lump poems by type, um, by topic or form place, et cetera, and we don't really have a, a strategy to separate those groups. So again, we're going to talk a lot today about the importance of that um, continuity or cohesion and variation, right? So, you know, lumping poems together tends to create a lot of just kind of clumps that don't allow for an organic flow for the reader and don't think about that arc through the book. Um, so, and then thirdly, we often lean too hard into regularity and continuity, and we're afraid of variation. So, so again, just some of our default habits around, um, the way we've been taught to group things, um, can get in our way. And so we have to break out of that a little bit and really lean more towards a sense of flow and variation. And we'll talk about how to um, get there in a moment. So, but beyond beyond all of these reasons that we might be getting, you know, gummed up in our uh, in our approach, um, you know, the biggest challenge I think is that we've been told 
we've we've not been given good instruction from folks who are experienced in um, in creating books of poetry, largely because they haven't thought about the process much themselves, and it's sort of only only accidentally or intuitively that they come up with a good structure. So. So we tend to get this advice, you know, oh, just spread the poems out on the floor, take a look, you know, find find a line through them. And um, that is, you know, that, that might be a good, uh, you know, way to deal with a man, manuscript physically at some point. But if we don't have strategies about how to find our way through those poems, well, putting them out on the floor is not gonna help much. Okay, so essential steps to sequencing poems in your book. And, you know, again, keep in mind, these are not formulas. These are, these are sort of stages that you might be going back and forth between a bit as you create the manuscript. But, but essentially, you know, it is fairly simple. We need to identify the themes. Um, from there, I like to suggest we find anchor poems. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by anchor poems in a moment. Uh, we identify the openers and closers. Those are a little bit different than the anchor poems. And um, then we have to, you know, we have to sit with how the poems talk to one another. And that's where we're gonna spend a little bit longer today unpacking what that means. How do poems talk to one another? Uh, I think we've all heard, oh, you know, the poems should should resonate, and they should they should have this dialogue. Um, well, what does that mean, and how can we how can we think about the elements in the poems um, in that that sense of talking to one another? Um, and then once we've kind of gone through those steps of the process, then we can really think about ordering the book for both cohesion and variation, um, as we've talked about. So. So that's what we're going to cover today. Okay, so theme. So we talked about this last week just to uh, reorient ourselves. You know, the theme is the, the territory that's covered in the book. And um, we don't have to have started with the theme in mind. I just really want to emphasize that because as soon as I introduce this idea of theme, folks are um, feeling like, oh no, I didn't start with a theme. I'm going to be, it's going to be impossible to, to order a manuscript. No, 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 no. The theme is something you discover in this process. So, so don't worry if you haven't started with a theme. Um, themes help you hone what gets included. So remember we said one of those primary challenges is what to even include in the manuscript. So the theme really helps us hone what gets included and what might might be outside of that territory. Um, so when we're not clear about the book's theme, it's really hard. It's really, really hard to create a structure and to sequence the poems in the book. Um, so, you know, I, I encourage folks to think about how clear are you about the book's themes? And is that maybe a first step to, um, to, to working through the challenge of um, structuring and ordering. Anchor poems. Okay, so I really love this idea of anchor poems. And, you know, again, I don't want to suggest that that there are, uh, you know, definitive uh, ways to identify what an anchor poem is. Um, to me, it's it's the poems that have more gravitas than others in the book. Um, you know, I think we all know when particular poems hold a, a more significant amount of energy than other poems in the book. And it's actually appropriate that poems have different, um, different amounts of gravitas or, or energy um, because we can't be always hitting the reader over the head with, with really, really the really powerful poems, right? Um, so anchor poems tend to speak most directly to the book's themes. Um, they might achieve a level of sophistication or complexity that others don't. Um, and like I said, you want to disperse these throughout the book. So, so they aren't, they aren't 
again, like to, to go back to that, that challenge of our tendency to lump all the, all the, you know, the hot poems together and then have other stuff outside of that. We want to think about anchor poems as, as part of that thread that's going to lead the reader through the arc of the book. Um, another way to think about anchor poems is, is um, a constellation. So, you know, when we look up at a section of the sky and there are, there are stars that are brighter than the other stars and those stars um, start to form a pattern, a picture in our mind, that's how anchor poems function in a book. Um, so the space between them is as important to forming the book shape um, as it is in, in their relation to one another. So, so it's, it's a sense of, of uh, creating pattern, but also creating space between um, those primary poems is another way to, to say anchor poem. Openers and closers. So, so again, I wanted to, to emphasize that that openers and closers are not the same as anchor poems. So I think another place we tend to get tripped up is we think we need to put the, uh, you know, again, these anchor poems, these poems that are maybe a bit more powerful than others. We tend to think that those should go in um, the opening and closing positions. So within the book, within sections of the book, um, in fact, um, they do slightly different work. And last week we talked about the function of openers and closers. Um, they function a little bit differently, right? So, so openers and closers are really sensitive to how the poem introduces the readers to the book, book's theme. Um, a good opener has voice. It has the presence of the poet really strong in it. Um, openers tend to ask questions. They invite the reader into some kind of inquiry. Um, closers tend to be a bit quieter, like the last lines of poems. And closers make a satisfying end, but don't shut that door entirely. So you can kind of begin to see as you go through the poems that you want to include, um, some might function in this anchor poem, uh, have anchor poem potential, and others might have more potential as an opener and closer. So they're, they're slightly different and there can be overlap. I mean, certainly an anchor poem could start the book or could end the book, um, but they don't necessarily, they don't necessarily belong in that position. And I wanted to, to make that distinction. Okay, so how poems talk to one another. So this is a question um, that I get quite a lot. Um, and again, like with the book's theme, I want to emphasize that your poems are naturally going to talk to one another. It's not something that you necessarily, again, are thinking about as you develop the poems for the book. Um, it's something that we are invited to pay more attention to as we look at poems together as a whole. So, um, so don't, you know, this isn't to say you should be putting this pressure on the generative process. Um, really, I think that could be very counterproductive. Um, so, you know, but once we have a good number of poems, we can begin to see how they're talking to one another. Um, and it's exciting. It's exciting to see these connections between the poems. Um, so just as lines of a poem um, talk to one another, the poems and a group of poems are going to have these resonances that, that elevate that elevate one another um, ultimately. Okay, so how poems talk to one another, and I want to I want to just acknowledge that these are these are sort of conceptual ways of talking about things that we're probably very familiar with in poems, but we might not be used to thinking about them in terms of of our our work in a manuscript. So, um, and I use I use these terms the way I feel they work for, for me and for the students in my manuscript class. And so if you have a different definition of something like motif, um, you know, feel free to use your own words, you know, just cross out motif and, and put your own word there. Um, but essentially, 
you know, the poems talk to one another, obviously around theme. Um, you know, we're coming back to this, this, this idea of the territory, right? So, so what territory of human experience is the book, is the book centered in? And how are those poems bringing out different aspects of that theme? Um, they're going to be hopefully talking to each other quite a lot in the book's territory or theme. Um, the poet's unique voice. We talked about this last week as something that's very important to publishers. Um, so, so voice, there are a lot of elements that go into a poet's voice and we could probably spend um, a whole masterclass there, uh, series just talking about uh, what creates unique voice. Um, but for the purpose of today, just think about it as the unique use of language that that is uniquely yours as a poet. Um, so the quirks and the stylistic choices um, that you make in terms of your syntax and your diction and all those lovely things that come out on the page um, that tell the reader uh, this is you know, a specific person's voice. So, so the poems are gonna talk to each other within that voice. Um, tone. So tone is uh, the emotional hue of the piece. Um, sometimes it relates to the poem's pace, you know, is it meditative? Um, you know, how does the reader feel when they read the poem? And so, so there will be tonal shifts throughout the manuscript, but, but there can be predominant tones that happen um, throughout the, uh, the space of the book. Motifs. So motifs are repeated images, they're details, uh, they're the types of details that, that you tend to repeat in poems. Um, it's not a bad thing, you know, I think we've been, been taught, oh, well, don't repeat yourself. Um, but a motif is something that becomes more meaningful the more it's re repeated. So they're your obsessions, your curiosities. A lot of times, um, you know, for me included, they come from the natural world. Um, you know, I like, I like to include, include birds and rocks and geology and physics um, in my poems. And so they, they show up over and over again, um, not necessarily as the subject matter, but as these, as these uh, you know, pieces that, that are returned to as motifs. Um, form. So formal choices can also be a way in which poems talk to each other across a manuscript. So I'm not really talking about formal poetry per se, not, not saying we all need to write sonnets, um, but the choices that you make in how you break the line, uh, stanzas, how things appear on the page, um, there's, there's going to be a level of consistency and variation, right, in the form. Um, subject matters. So there's the least amount of overlap in subject matter, typically. So, so you're, you might be sensing that there's a pattern to this, and I'm going to go on to the next slide in a minute, but theme is the place of greatest overlap, greatest amount of talking to one another, voice also an area of greatest um, potential of poems talking to one another, but as we get lower down in the list um, to form and subject, that's where there tends to be a lot more variation, right? So, so along these um, lines of creating cohesion and creating surprise and delight through variation, um, these are elements that we can use to create both of those. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, also, we can, we can have poems that talk to each other in terms of the point of view used. So I, you, or third person poems, you know, we can, we can certainly have a lot of variation in that. Um, stylistic details, so the way that you use punctuation, that's kind of in form and kind of in voice, but, but sometimes stylistic details do become a unifying principle or something that, that allows for that variation. Um, and then your use of titles and so forth. So, so it's it's in some ways very um, it's very dynamic um, the ways in which poems can talk to one another. But these are the these are the areas that I think are most helpful to think about 
uh, this challenge of sequencing. Okay, so in terms of consistency and variation, um, again, I think the territory of the book and the voice of the book are areas where there's gonna be a great deal of consistency. So if you look at books that you love um, from the, the poets that you're just really drawn to their work and wanna spend time in their books, um, you know, maybe go in with this question, well, how are they creating you know, this consistency? And can I sense what their territory and their theme is in this book? And how is their voice, um, you know, is their voice creating consistency? How does it create consistency? Um, and then in terms of, you know, as we kind of go down, so there's going to be some tonal shifts. We don't want the whole book to, uh, to be all one tone, right? Um, I actually have had students say to me, oh, I really didn't like this particular book from a published poet because I felt that the poems had the same tonal quality over and over and over again. Um, you know, so, so we may have personal preference in terms of consistency and variation, but typically in a book, we see tonal variation, right? So, so one poem might be very meditative. Another poem might be a little bit more punchy and grabbing the reader and saying something. Um, you know, you may have a poem that is, that is somber and then poems that are a little bit more on the side of awe or joy. And those can sit very nicely together within a book, um, but there are gonna be some tonal um, consistencies, right? So meditative followed by energetic, you know, and, and so forth. And that can be a variation strategy. Um, motifs we talked about, I think motifs are moments where the reader is, um, you know, it, it can it can spark that little moment of joy when we see a motif come back in a surprising way. Um, so again, you know, not necessarily lumping um, poems with similar motifs, but spreading them out through the book so that the reader sees, oh, okay, we're coming back to this motif of um, of a bird or um, meditating on, uh, you know. any detail, really any detail, you know, household objects, right? Um, so many things can be motifs, but but the reader is gonna find pleasure when they they hear them coming back. Um, form, form can, you know, again, it can be something that is very consistent through a book. I've seen books lately that are all in couplets. Every single poem is in, is in couplets and that works completely fine for that book because there's a lot of variation in other, areas, right? So there's a lot of tonal variation or there's a lot of variation in subject matter, um, et cetera. Um, so if you're choosing to create consistency through form, you'll have to create variation in, in another way. Um, on the other hand, you can have a book that, that does a lot of variation with form. Um, I was at a reading last night of the poet um, Chrysosto Apache and his work, when you look at his first book, all kinds of variation in the form, um, yet there's great consistency in the voice and the approach um, to making poems in other ways. So, so again, consistency and variation. And then subject matter, again, that's something, something that we can get a little bit tripped up on. Okay, I'm gonna put all the, you know, the related subject matters in one, one place and, you know, and then I'm gonna group other subject matters in another place. Um, I encourage you to think, more dynamically about subject as something that can, um, again, add to that sense of variation through the book and allow the reader an organic experience of uh, the book's territory. So just, um, we don't have time to go into a lot of example and detail, but I wanted to pull up this uh, this book that a lot of folks know and are familiar with, so Maggie Smith, Good Bones, um, and kind of walk you through, just by looking at the TOC, kind of walk us through, well, what do we mean by all of these different, um, you know, theme and voice and tone and so forth. So 
So the theme of Good Bones is really is motherhood, the territory of motherhood. Um, we can't see her voice on, you know, by looking at the TOC, but but I can tell you that her voice in this book is really leaning towards the lyric. It uses the language of folk tales and stories. Um, and that voice is very, very consistent throughout the book. Um, so again, theme, no doubt in my mind, motherhood, voice really consistent in these particular ways. Um, the tone, so the tone, uh, it, it, it varies, right? So it goes from curiosity in some cases to a sense of wonder, um, there's fear and worry. And all of those fit, those, those tonal pieces really are appropriate, again, to that theme of motherhood, right? Um, the child's curiosity, um, meeting with the mother's sense of wonder, the child's fear meeting up with the mother's sense of worry. Um, the motifs here. So some of the motifs that, that I tracked through this book, and there are probably even more, but you can actually see them in the titles. So she returns to the motif of sky and birds. So there are hawks and crows and nests. Um, she writes about household um, structures and objects. So, you know, rooms in the house, um, old clocks, you know, things of that nature. Um, so, you know, the motif isn't a, the motifs aren't, aren't an ordering structure, but they bring a lot of variation and delight and a sense of cohesion in the book. Um, subject matters. So she returns to um, childhood questions. So why is the sky the sky? Um, you know, sort of these, these, um, these, you know, questions that you might get from a child, but that lead really well into um, an exploration in a poem. Um, of course, she talks about experience, particular experiences within motherhood, within childhood. Um, she talks about the relationship with the father. And um, there's a ton of, you know, curiosities about the natural wo world and about creatures in that world. So, so again, you can kind of start to see how in a book of poems, these different elements can um, create cohesion. They can create surprise and delight through variation, and they can um, give the reader a whole experience of that book's particular um, territory. Okay, so cohesion and variation. So publishers are really looking for, for both of these, right? They really do want to see that a book has, has, has has clearly laid out its thematic content, um, but, you know, and they don't want to see a book that's all over the map stylistically, right? We, we know that because we know what we enjoy as readers and we enjoy books that, that do feel very thoughtful in those ways. Um, on the other hand, um, variation is just so important. I just keep hearing this over and over again from publishers that, that they don't want, um, you know, they don't want a book that that just hits the same note over and over and over again, right? So, so I want to encourage you to to not lean too hard in in one direction towards cohesion or towards variation. We have to find, you know, it's sort of like that that process of if you've ever taken a, um, you know, a yoga class or a dance class where they where they encourage you to do that that exercise where you are standing on your feet and you have to kind of lean forward and lean back in order to find that center point. That's really what we're doing when we're when we're looking at uh, creating a manuscript, finding that that center um, point between cohesion and variation. Um, So I want to pause here and just allow um, you all to digest this slightly and to think about, you know, maybe just write some notes. So how does your um, manuscript or how do your poems talk to one another? You know, what do you, what do you see as your territory, your theme? Um, how, you know, how might you describe your voice? Are you more lyric? Are you more narrative? Um, what are some of the tones you 
find coming back and, and um, important to the work that you're doing in this particular manuscript? Um, do you have a sense of your motifs? Uh, what do you think about form and um, subject matter? So I'm going to pause here and give us, you know, three or four minutes just to go through this exercise and then we'll have some discussion. All right, so hopefully that that yielded some, you know, maybe some itty bitty insights, or maybe you're still, you know, wondering, well, how do I how do I possibly identify all of this, um, all of these different ways that my manuscript might be um, cohesive and, you know, have that variation potential. Um, one thing I, I just want to say about my own process and about what I found for a lot of folks is the importance of having community. 
um, to reflect back to you some of these these themes and you know insights about your voice and um, sort of the the primary uh, thrust of the work that you're trying to do. Oftentimes, those insights come through community. Um, so I just want to you know put a little plug in for doing this as a group. It can be really really helpful. Um, I think sometimes folks are shy to jump in and share work in this way, but um, with a lot of good guidance and structure, I think you can get that feedback um, without it, you know, coming into the territory of, um, of preferences, right? So a lot of workshops I find can, you know, kind of easily get into this, like, well, I like this and, and I'm, you know, maybe, maybe I don't like that so much. And um, this is not at all how, um, how the manuscript courses run. They're really focused on gaining those insights and creating a lot of clarity around those elements of your, your work and honoring, honoring the specific work that you are trying to do as a poet, rather than um, you know, trying to make the work fit some kind of mold uh, that, we've, that we think we, that we need to fit. So, so community can be just so valuable in this process. So I'd love to open it up for questions. If you have um, insights or thoughts about this exercise that we went through around identifying themes and all the way down to your subject matters, I'd love to, to hear what you discovered. Um, so feel free to, to type your comments and questions in the chat and feel, feel free to unmute yourself and um, jump in. So was it easy to answer the questions or, or were, were they maybe a little bit new and hard to pinpoint at this point? Um, Rada, I'm going to answer that. Um, I thought the exercise was, can you hear me? Yes, thanks. That the exercise was excellent in my view. Just, I know everyone's at different stages, but, um, for me, who have gotten a group of poems together in a little collection and even sent it out as a chat book and uh, side note, have been accepted to have it published. Um, but having gotten that far with, with a little collection of poems, I now I'm like, Oh my God, I'm just beginning to see what I'm doing here. Um, and so writing towards these specifics as you asked us to do is really revealing. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome and congratulations. That's great news. Oh, it's great news, but it's caused quite a concern in me. And maybe this is my question for today. Um, since I've got this all together, and now have a clear picture of what, what, what I think the book should be. Um, you know, I've written quite a few more poems that I wouldn't say are totally finished. I mean, you know, they're kind of in the process, in line, in the line of being um, revised and, and thought over more carefully, but I don't know. I mean, do you do you go ahead and let a small collection be published, realizing that it really should be a bigger that there that I haven't said it all. <laughs> yeah, no, this, is, this is a really good question. I have talked to a number of of authors recently who are um, coming out with full length uh, collections or um, books that that actually started as smaller manuscripts and may have been published as a chapbook to start. So a chapbook can actually almost function like um, the first part of this process or, or one of the early parts of this process, which is uh, the anchor poems, right? So, so a um, chapbook would be more dense in, in poems that um, might uh, qualify for that, that anchor poem um, uh, status. So I, there, there's no, I think there's no reason to, um, if, if you, 
feel that the chapbook, the shorter work is complete in itself, but could also be a larger work. Um, there's no, there's no problem in that. It's actually a great problem to have. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. Thank you. So I'm seeing, um, should anchor poems talk to one another? How to determine where place, where to place them? Um, you know, is there a basis like every X number of poems? This is a really good question. And I think that yes, the anchor poems do tend to talk to one another, you know, again, around um, that around the, the top level, uh, the outer part of the circle, right? The thematic, um, the thematic content of the book, they talk to each other. Um, certainly, you know, the, the voice is going to be um, present in, in all of those anchor poems. So I think more than uh, the lesser, I don't like to say lesser, more than the, the supporting poems, <laughs> the anchor poems do talk to one another and can really, again, create that sense of um, drawing the reader through the territory of the book by doing so. Um, how to place them? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think it depends on how many, how many poems you've identified as anchor poems, how, how they're talking to each other, um, what that arc is that you've determined by looking at them together. Um, but they, but they would be spaced out through the book. You don't want them again, all clumped together. Um, so it really depends on what's, what's between them, um, what that cadence would be. Um, Stephanie asks, I'm curious about outliers in, a, in any of these areas. For example, if tone is relatively consistent and a few tonally different outliers are included, how does that impact the manuscript? I think what we're talking about here is maybe having a balance, right? So you don't want all, all one tone in the manuscript if there are, but, but if there are, if like 90% of the poems fit within, you know, four or five different tones, and there are like two or three poems that that don't that aren't talking <laughs> in that way or aren't tonally consistent. Then you might have to set those aside, you know, set them aside, not not necessarily exclude them, but see if they are distracting, right? So so that's the barometer. It, are they distracting from um, from the main from the main arc? Are they distracting from um, from the book as a whole uh, by introducing something that's too different, right? So, so there's no right or wrong answer in that, in that and we do want variation. So I, I hesitate to say, well, if something um, seems like it doesn't fit, we'll just exclude it. Don't, don't exclude it, set it to the side, see if it is talking, how is it talking? Um, are there motifs that are linking it to the rest of the book, even if the tone seems different? Are there, uh, you know, thematic nuances that, that actually are coming out? So, so not all poems are going to talk to each other in the same way. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's a matter of feeling out, okay, does this, pop, does this poem talk in any way, right? Is it, is it talking in any way to the other poems in the book? If the answer is no, it's really not talking in any way to the other poems, then that might be a clue that we need to, to permanently set it aside and say, this isn't part of this manuscript, it's part of something else. Um, but, but tonal variations are great. I mean, I think we really delight in them. Um, let's see. Um, most of my poems fit into, and by the way, I'm seeing a lot of questions about the manuscript class. What I'm gonna do is just send out um, details in the follow-up email so that I can um, get to your questions about the, uh, the content today and, and then follow up with that later. So thank you for asking those questions. Um, most of my poems fit into more than one of my usual themes, um, nature, spirituality, memoir. Can sequencing serve to emphasize one of those themes? Um, because you want to include all of them together in one manuscript is what I'm, what I'm assuming. Um, yes, I mean, I think that, that sequencing, you know, for example, um, taking these, uh, related, um, you know, I don't, I don't see nature, spirituality, and memoir necessarily as separate 
separate themes, right? So there, there's probably there are probably other themes within those uh, the, those different types of poem um, that would serve to create the whole of the book, right? So nature and spirituality often goes together. Spirituality and memoir. I mean, all of those could be um, very easily woven together, even within and probably are even within the work. So, so I would say identifying, you know, another, another thematic um, lens uh, to look at those types of poems would be, would maybe be a first step, but they can absolutely all live together. Um, uh, Catherine uh, Saluha um, says, I'd like to share a comment about series poems. Yes, please. Hi, Rada. Hi, everybody. Rada, I really appreciate your presentation. And I want to say almost how I want to say scientific it is. And I mean, in the best way, scientific, you know, <laughs> like that you really, because I'm a woman of science, yeah. you really break it down, you know, as you said, and not just have it be this mysterious, oh, go, to, go on your gut instinct, but like foggy thing. So anyway, I wanted to thank you for that. I just wanted to say quickly, I found like I almost feel like it was a hack for sequence. You know, I didn't do it on purpose for sequencing, but I started to see. I just really love um, books that had what I call series poems. You know, like a repeated title or you know title. You know, part one, part two, part three, or repeated subject with different point of view. What that, it's just how I think of as like a series or chain. And and I so in my book that's coming out next year, I ended up just working on in, within that and ended up having sort of like three series, you know, what I think of as series, you know, revisitations, you know, of ideas. And so then I didn't know ahead of time, but then when it came to ordering, that really helped because those started to become those cross structural, you know, beams or arcs or whatever that I could like spread out through the ordering. I mean, there, you know, there was still, of course, a whole lot of work about figuring out the in-between ones. Mm -hmm. But but anyway, it just seemed to be a way to start to think about it as like is like a, a series of poems, if that makes sense to others. Yeah, that's great. I love that, right? So that really speaks to that the um we talked a little bit about this last week, having a parallel process where where you're starting to notice and then you know continuing work along these different tracks at the same time. Um, that's so, it's so wonderful to, to have that example. Thank you. Um, okay, just a few more questions and I'm realizing that we're almost out of time, which is amazing. The time always goes so quickly in these. Um, so, okay to mix humorous and serious poems, um, Ellen asks. Yeah, absolutely. If they're talking to each other in different ways, um, you know, if they are sort of part of a thematic territory, um, but, but one's humorous and one's serious? Absolutely. I think, again, we don't want a book that's all, all just funny poems or all just serious poems. Um, you know, it's true to our lives. We're going through, even if we're going through a period of grief, for example, there are gonna be moments of humor, right? Or if we're not experiencing, you know, um, maybe the, the more somber side of things, you know, it, it's true to life that these things are included. So I think it's it's good to have both. Um, Jen says, one poetry teacher told me that when sending out a manuscript, you should just put all the strongest poems first and then reorder once you are accepted. Oh gosh, thoughts on this. Um, okay, so first of all, I have a problem with this idea of strongest poems because who's, who's saying what's strongest? Um, I mean, I think it's much more helpful to think about um, Again, how are you introducing the, the reader to the book's territory? And what are those anchor poems? So if anchor poems are what we mean by strongest poems, um, I would not, I don't think that those necessarily make good openers. They're not the ones that, that are going to, um, I mean, sometimes they are, sometimes they do that work, but I think we need to really think about how do we draw the reader in and say, hey, come explore this territory with me. Um, that's a much more interesting way to uh, to order and begin the manuscript. Um, of course, you don't want you don't want poems that aren't um, aren't grabbing the reader um, up front. You want ones that are you know going to really compel someone to keep reading for whatever reason. 
So if that's what we mean by strong, then then um, then I guess that that kind of stands. But but I don't agree. I don't agree with this this strategy of um, you know. I, I just think it's problematic to think about about strongest. Um, can there be too many motifs? Um, Celeste. Celeste asks, um, no, I don't think so. I think that, again, they're just these moments that, of delight that come up and, and help us to live in the world of this specific poet, you know, and I, I wouldn't worry about, um, I wouldn't worry too much about how motifs, uh, how, how much motifs are creating that consistency. They're really more an element of delight and they tend to be very natural. Again, they're not something that that um, that I encourage folks to build a manuscript around, um, but they do help for poems to talk to one another and for the reader to have these moments of coming back and recognizing, oh, oh yeah, oh here's another here's another instance of the poet noticing the quality of light. Um, it, it's just it's it's wonderful when we see those. So no, can't have too many motifs. Um, any other? Questions. Let me see. I'm going to just scroll back to see if I missed anything in the chat or feel free to um, unmute yourself. We're right at the hour, but I'll take one more question if there is anything. All right. Well, We'll leave it there. I know I've given you a lot to think about and digest. I will put this up on YouTube. I'll send you um, the links to everything and answers to the questions about the manus manuscript course. Um, thanks again so much for being here. Really appreciated seeing you this morning and I'll see you guys all again soon.